This time on Norfolk Perspectives, you're going to meet the new president of NAACP and Councilwoman Williams. The Norfolk Public Library is celebrating African American History Month all month long, and our post cemeteries has a story to tell about Calvary Cemetery, and the Hurrah Players is bringing out a brand new play just for you for African American History Month. Stay tuned for some great stuff right here on Norfolk Perspectives. <music> Welcome to Norfolk Perspectives. I'm Bob Batcher, and the month of February is an exciting time to celebrate history, but mainly look to the future. And Angela Williams, how's it going? Councilwoman great. Angela Williams. It is great. I was at a meeting with you, and you just were all excited because there was a new president for NAACP that had been elected, I think, about three minutes before. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to let you make the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, as you know, Tristan Bro is the new president for the Norfolk chapter of the NAACP, and he is actually the youngest president on history. I know he looks 12, <laughs> but he's really 27? Five. Five. 25. Whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we're not, and that's the last age we're talking about. <laughs> Absolutely, because okay. I just had a birthday, so don't ask. <laughs> there we go. Okay, well, let's, so let's talk, and I'm not going to share your age, but for both of you. She's 24. <laughs> that's how you get elected president. <laughs> what does the NAACP mean? Well, originally the NAACP is one of the oldest organizations that was formulated to fight injustices for African Americans. Mm -hmm. And so what we're working on now is to make the NAACP relevant to the issues that African Americans have in 2012, 2013, and beyond. Yeah, because your dad was active. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And how about your parents? My uh, my grandparents were very very active. Okay. My parents were very very active. I'm not in the Norfolk branch. Um, they were from New York, and so uh, they were vice president president. Of they kept me involved a lot. And going back to her father, her father was one of my predecessors. He was the past president of the Norfolk branch of the okay. NAACP. Now I'm talking to two people who were very active in the community. Councilwoman, mm -hmm. student, but former student. You still a student? No, former student. <laughs> former student. <laughs> but actually very much involved. For people who aren't on the sofa who are involved, we're saying, but it's not relevant anymore. The fight's over. A lot of people feel that way, that the fight is over, but it's far from over. The, the issues might have changed. You know, in the 1960s, you had to fight for equality. You had to fight for an opportunity just to be included. Now that we are somewhat included, what are we doing to enhance the next mm -hmm. generation? So the argument now is, is that why aren't we addressing youth crimes? Why aren't we addressing the dropout rate? Why aren't we addressing some of the social issues that we have for a younger generation? You know, my, my grandmother always wanted to talk about, uh, you know, going to... Uh, the select bathrooms and the select stalls and not being included in certain mm -hmm. restaurants. I never went through that. Um, and I would, have, I would never want to go through that. But I do see some silent discrimination when it comes to equal opportunity for education, when you have the elite and the non-elite, those who are able to get on financial aid and have an opportunity to get a higher degree because education is the future. So there's a lot of small things that we have to address as a branch because we have to be future thinking and make the NAACP back relevant again. Okay, let's talk about your election. I mean, did you walk it's over? <laughs> the work is done. <laughs> They're stuck oh, with me now. <laughs> let, me, let me rewind that. You walk into your first meeting, how old were you? Uh, my first meeting as president or first meeting ever? Ever. I was four years old. What the heck were you doing there, <laughs> four-year-old? Did people ask you that? I was dragged by my grand-aunt by the neck <laughs> to attend a youth council meeting. She got me Did involved. you tell her you were even too young for a youth council <laughs> meeting? I was four and not stupid until I wasn't too <laughs> young. <laughs> You're never too young. <laughs> never too young. <laughs> You're never too young. And plus, I said before, I, I was not stupid to tell her no on anything. But she wanted me to understand what the purpose of the NAACP was. She wanted me to understand the history of the organization. So it's important to know what that history is about, but not necessarily to dwell in the old days? You should never dwell in the old days. You should remember it. 
Okay. Um, for my sake and for my generation, you should remember the, the lessons that you were taught by your grandparents mm -hmm. about what happened, but you learn from it and you move forward. I think that in order, before, in order at the branch, we have a, a philosophy that in order to know where we're going, we have to know where we, we've come from. And so that's why I'm so glad to have so many past presidents who are still involved in the branch so they can be mentors to the new executive committee so we can kind of move forward into new generation. I know, Angela, I've heard you talk about very, very lovingly about your, your parents mm -hmm. and your dad, but it's never a remember when. So you're kind of able to keep that in perspective then? Absolutely. I mean, like Tristan said, our parents have given us great life lessons. They've given us um, good morals, good principles, things like that that we use. And there, there's probably not a week that goes by that I don't remember something that my mother or father told me when I'm trying to make a decision or when I'm dealing with something. But also, I have to take what they gave me then and use it now. And I think that's where we are with the NAACP. We don't want to forget the things that our grandparents and great grandparents went through, but we have to also look at the issues that we face now and how do we overcome those issues that are different than the issues. They may have the same theme, but the action is different. Okay, so it kind of it gives you a reference or context. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so what are your meetings like now compared to what they were before then? Well, first, uh, I've only had one meeting. <laughs> I've been the, the and president of. And it was a successful of, meeting. And it was a very you successful. You got through it. I, I swore got through him it. in. Oh, you swore <laughs> I, him I in? I swore him in. <laughs> I got through it. But uh, the meetings are very different than before. I am leaning more towards a community-driven meeting where the citizens and the membership they have an opportunity to bring their issues before the branch, to rant and rave about things that are going on. Mm -hmm. um, I present the process of sending certain issues to a committee, the committee getting back to me and telling me what direction we should take, and then as president, taking that direction. I think it's important to remember protocol and to be constitutionally binding to, uh, to, to your presidency, but it's also important to have a caring heart. And a lot of people have certain issues that they want to address and they just want to be heard. And it gets very emotional. And to take some of the load off of our great city council, <laughs> we're going to hear them. <laughs> and then we'll know, you know, what direction the branch needs to take to go forward. But the meeting was, was wonderful. It was actually very quick. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good show. Well, I want to stay in touch with you. Perfect. Feel Perfect. It's an open invitation to come and sit on the sofa and kind of talk about what, some, what are some of those issues and what are the solutions. Because as uh, Councilwoman Williams knows, in, in Norfolk, we are taking that input process, that inclusion process, very seriously. So we, we want to hear from you. When we come back, we're going to be talking about uh, the libraries and special program they have to allow for that quick peek and to put it all in context. Stay tuned for more. Average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Welcome back to Know for Perspective. Wow, I'm impressed when the youth, 24, take over. Hey, I got Valerie Pierce, who's with the Norfolk Public Library. The Park Place Branch. Park Place Branch Manager. Okay, now the world centers around that library. It is a cool place. I love Park Place, and it is a very cool place. You know, it, I was sharing in pre-tape with you. I, I was over there one time when they were getting ready for the reopening after it had been renovated. Mm -hmm. I was there about an hour and a half earlier, and it was packed with kids because they didn't want to wait. Their enthusiasm is mm -hmm. just tremendous. And it's still packed with kids. <laughs> now, is that why you're here to talk about uh, African American History Month, because of the kind of enthusiasm there is to it, or because it's an obligation to share? No, it's, it's actually both. It's obligation and it's enthusiasm on my part, definitely. The one thing I've noticed with the Norfolk Public Library is it seems like uh, wherever there's a heritage to celebrate, 
you guys are up front and ready to do it. Yeah, definitely. We uh we have a focus on four different multicultural um, months within the, the year. Of course, February, African American History Month, and we celebrate that. In May, we have um, Asian Pacific Heritage Month that we celebrate. In September, October, we have uh, the Hispanic Heritage Month, and then in November, we celebrate uh, American Indian Heritage Month. Now, why is that important to the library? Into the community? Because of uh, the diversity here in Norfolk, and we want to make sure that all the groups are represented and we want to show that diversity that we have here. In talking with uh, the councilwoman and the new president of NAACP, relevance was talked about yes. in the first segment. Does this help and provide that kind of context? Oh, definitely. In looking back and celebrating the history? Definitely, definitely. It's like what uh, the president said, you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. So. Yeah. Now, we're going to have at the end, we're going to have the real Harriet Tubman. No, not really. <laughs> But, uh, she's here. Uh, she's here. <laughs> um, and we were talking about how old is, was Harriet Tubman, and a lot of that's kind of on recall, isn't it? But that's kind of getting reconnected? Definitely. Definitely. Okay, so you're going to read a bunch of books? Um, no, we're going to put on some programs. We're going to do some reading, and we're going to put some programs. Okay, now wait a minute. I was prepared to go to the little cabin and pull them out with the little cards. Oh, no, 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 no nope. more cards, no more cards. The Dewey Decimal System? The Dewey Def Decimal gone? System. Gone? No, it's not gone, definitely. It is here. <laughs> it's here. Well, it's not the little cards. Where is but it? But no more cards. It's on the computer now. Okay, so if I want to find a book mm -hmm. about the African American History Month. Mm -hmm. You just go on the computer, type your subject in, and bam. You no, get a minute. bunch of results. You mean all I got to do is type in African American History Month? Mm -hmm. I don't have to type in, what would it be Dewey Decimal Wise? Um, if you wanted to type in as far as the you number, my age way, <laughs> if you look at the 900s in history, you'll get a lot of uh, history from that uh, number with the Dewey okay. Decimal System. But if you just type in African American History Month, you'll get a lot of hits. Well, let me ask you, when we talk about relevance, if I can type in Af African American History Month, why do you have to remember the Dewey Decimal System? Because <laughs> I'm a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because it still That's provides why. the order and structure, right? Yeah, and, and if the computers go down one day and somebody comes in to look for a book, I need to know what area of that Dewey Decimal System I need to look in. Because it, really, it forms the foundation for even setting up the library. Exactly, exactly. Okay, cool. Now, I'm not going to be reading, I'm going to be experiencing. What kinds of things am I going to be experiencing? Oh, wow, well, you're going to be experiencing a couple of different types of programs. Um, NPL, we have our core programs that will be at uh, several different libraries. We have the Move to the African Drum Beat. That's going to be at three uh, libraries, and it's a traditional African drumming program. Then we have the uh, African Oral Stories by Dylon Pritchett, and he's going to be doing African-American storytelling, and that's going to be at three libraries. And then we have the African American Inventors presented by the Green Room Production. And they're going to do a theatrical performance about African American history. So that'll be at four branch libraries. All over the place. All over the place. You have to visit all your libraries in order to get all of this. And one great way to visit is to go online. Oh, definitely. And it'll lay out the whole schedule. Mm -hmm. If you go to www.npl. Dot lib dot va dot us and you can go to our website and you'll get all the the fun things that we're doing with the library for African American History Month. Okay, I got one minute left. You got chosen to sit, come from the committee. Yes. What's going on at Park Place? The oh, heck with wow. the rest of the library. Oh, I thought you meant that. Right. <laughs> Park Place. Um, we're doing a couple of things, but one major thing that we're doing for African American History Month this month will be. On February 16th, we're partnering with the Park Place Child Life Center, and we have um, some special art classes going on over there. And the kids are actually creating pieces of artwork to hang in Park Place Branch Library. Cool. Yes. So we're going to do a uh, art exhibition. We're going to do it up the whole thing on February 16th, that Saturday at 3 p.m. So it's going to be a happening place to be. At. Definitely, we want the uh, the community to come out and support those young young artists. Thank you. Thanks for everything that you're doing to support the youth, but also the older people, too, about staying in touch with their roots. Definitely. Appreciate it. When we come back, we're we'll talking about recreation parks and open space and cemetery stories. Stay tuned. George, look.
look what I found. <laughs> Turn their curiosity into a lifelong love of learning. That's a periscope. <laughs> it's one of the most important gifts you can share. <laughs> Create a curious reader. Oh, you want to build a castle like that one? <laughs> this is super bedtime reading. Share a book together today. Visit read.gov. Welcome back to Nova Perspectives. I'm Bob Batcher, and we're talking about uh, the relevance of today in history, of uh, in celebrating African American history, and it's an important place to go in the cemetery. And Bobby Nelson, uh, public information specialist with our post, and uh, Ted Dudley, you're the bureau manager for cemeteries. First of all, I got it. We got to clarify. Okay, you're part of Recreation Parks and Open Space. Mm -hmm. So, what part of our post? are you would you say I would say the open space part it's the open space yeah because it really because in the creation of cemeteries mm -hmm. they were open space parks weren't they yes they were mm -hmm. yes. and they were a place to celebrate mm -hmm. yes yes we still have um, we have uh, Victoria uh, uh, rural landscape parks Victorian rural landscape parks um, that are cemeteries uh, Elmwood and Cedar Grove were designed in that fashion but um, as far as African American History Month goes um, Calvary Cemetery is our African American history I mean our African American um, cemetery in Norfolk it's a very important um, cultural resource where is it located it's at 1600 St. Julian Avenue right um, off the title to drive exactly yeah it okay. was established in 1877 uh, for the burial of Norfolk's African American citizens and for the next almost 100 years that was the only place in the city of Norfolk that African Americans could be interred. Therefore, um, it has become just a lesson in history. There is everything from the post-Civil War and Reconstruction era um, to Prohibition and the struggle for civil rights all the way up to present day. And the um, epitaphs on the stones uh, demonstrate that history as well as the people who are interred there who did uh, very important things in the formation of African American society, not just in Norfolk but across the South. And this, then, Calvary was a city owned. Oh, yes, it yes. was and is. The city yes. established it back in 1877, yes. That That's was correct. when the land was acquired to develop it as an African American cemetery. Right. Now, it's kind of like a park where it's open to the public? It is mm -hmm. open to the public, sunrise to sunset. Um, there are paved paths. Um, you can ride your bike. You can walk through there. I am working on developing some historic tours there um, to where people can come by and see for themselves who's there. And to that end, um, I have a presentation scheduled for Tuesday, February the 26th from 7 to 8 at the Pretlow Branch Library to talk about some of the very important African Americans uh, who are buried there, people who uh, were significant to the formation of current society um, for, for our entire community. Okay, now if I would, if I would project me on you, Bobby, uh, you got till the 25th to get ready. So I'd ask you to kind of think ahead. Got some, it's got some nuggets you want to share with us, but I know you. You got the daggone presentation already done. It's, it's pretty okay. much. Okay, so I know these are not challenging questions. Who's the, who's the most famous person buried there? Most famous. I, I'm not sure that I, to me, the most, I guess, remarkable person um, is uh, the former manservant for um, the Civil War. God, can't remember his name right now. Anyway, um, but this gentleman, um, what not only was a former slave, but then he became a reverend and a, and a leader uh, for the community. And I just I think that was a really big deal. Um, but you know, Bob, the the whole point of this is because we need to conserve Calvary, and um, it's really disintegrating right now. It's in, not in a good way. And not only do we have the opportunity to conserve it, but we have the opportunity to celebrate 136 years of African American oh. history. Mm -hmm. um, and I get calls uh, from around the state from. Um, folks, community activists who are upset that their black cemeteries have all but disappeared due to abandonment and neglect. Mm -hmm. We have a rare opportunity in Norfolk to keep that from happening, but it takes community engagement. The city considers the monuments and tombs and, and everything to be private property, um, and unfortunately when it comes to Calvary and, and many of our older cemeteries, families have passed away, moved away, or just don't have the money to take care of those lots anymore. So we need the community to get involved to to help those. And if we don't, we're really doing a disservice to the people who gave so much to ensure the freedom and the equality and continued prosperity of African American society and Norfolk. Because what we've been talking about in the show is that we're really able to take that quick 
peek back and put Absolutely. things in context. Mm -hmm. And what Absolutely. better place than the stories that are in the center? Right. And it's beautiful out there. It's pastoral. It's a nice walk. It's, it's very nice. And it's smack in the middle of the city. Mm -hmm. Pretty yes, much. It sure is. Ted, this conservatory approach, the model, is really one that's being used across the country. It is. Kind of bringing yes, awareness right. to the community of the importance of the cemetery and getting them involved, right? Mm -hmm. It is. And so there are models that are out there, and we just looked at their various ones and molded it to our community. And uh, we're, we're world pleased with it. We're world pleased with the community involvement. It's growing. Um, come March, we have a volunteer work days in our cemeteries. And um, we also, we start our tour of trees in March, Forest Lawn Cemetery. So we are, we're world pleased with our direction of uh, opening our cemeteries up to our community, showing them our historical value. Uh, and, you know, all of our Norfolk movers and shakers are buried in our cemeteries. Well, I, I, I guess I can honestly say this now with the two of you sitting on the sofa. A great place to ride a bike is in a cemetery. Yeah. Yes. Because you can kind of sightsee and take a, take a pause. Mm -hmm. yeah. February 26th? Yes, mm -hmm. Tuesday, February 26th from 7 to 8 p.m. at Pretlow. Um, we will discuss some of the interments at Calvary as well as our uh, present conservation efforts and what else needs to be done. And there's always an opportunity to get involved. Always. Absolutely, yes. Thanks for everything that you're doing. To bring out the awareness of the importance of our history, but more importantly, the importance of the people that were in that history. Yes. Thank you for everything. When we come back, I heard we might have a version of Harriet Tubman right there on the sofa. Stay tuned to find out. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspectives. Well, today's show we've been talking about the relevance and uh, in with African American History Month and looking back. Well, what better way to look back than through drama and uh, theater? And I've got Sharon Cook, who is uh, the Freedom Train director. Yes, I'm You're the guest directing director. the train. I'm directing the train, guest director for Hurrah Players' production of Freedom Train. Okay, now there are going to be people out there going to say, "No, -uh, she's an English teacher at Maury. She's <laughs> Ursula." <laughs> and a lot of other we're still, characters. Yeah, we're still on Ursula. And is she going to sing? No, I'm not in the play. You are in the row with the notebook. Right. I'm sitting in the back with the Telling notebook. Telling Dee Dee Hoskins right. how what she's going to do. Gonna be exactly. A very old Harriet Tubman? No, no. she's not. She is going to. I was worried be, about that. Right. Because Dee Dee. Uh, as you can see, she's a very beautiful young lady. Hi, Dee Dee. But she's, she's a wonderful <laughs> actress, too, though. Yeah. Um, um, but we have three Harriets, actually. Um, we have the younger version. That, um, Leave it to Hurrah to come up right, with exactly. more Harriet. We have a little girl who is playing um, Harriet at a young age. Dee Dee plays Harriet um, in the middle as a teenager and a young adult. Um, and then we have another young lady named Sharon who is playing Harriet, the older version of Harriet. And so it's sort of like a frame story. It opens with the older Harriet mm -hmm. um, kind of introducing the play, and then she takes us back. She narrates this story and takes us back in time, and then we can see um, the younger Harriet as she, you know, progresses and grows up and evolves into the young woman who decides to um, escape to freedom and come back to get um, to serve as a guide on the Underground Railroad and bring other slaves to freedom as well. You know, that, that explains because we were trying to figure out before doing the show um, how old Harriet Tubman was. And I asked Dee Dee, and she said, oh, about 18. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said, no, she was an older woman. But I realized when you look back, it, does it help you to really understand who Harriet Tubman was when she was 18? Um, as an 18 year old? I think it does. Well, in, when I read the script, um, I already knew that it was going to be old, younger, and then middle. Mm -hmm. So once I read the script, I didn't know how I was going to portray an older Harriet. Mm -hmm. But then again, um, it's sometimes come natural. I feel like knowing things already about Harriet Tubman, it was going to be kind of challenging to portray her character. Mm -hmm. But it's it comes natural now like it, what my character as Harriet Tubman in the middle I do most of the I like going to get the people and escaping to freedom and the younger Harriet that's just her like knowing who she was and how she was a tomboy mm -hmm. so you get to um, 
you know, her personality. Yeah, she had a little her. rebellious nature yeah. to her as a little girl. Right. She liked to get into, she would get into little fights with, you know, some of the other youngsters or her siblings and that sort of thing. Yeah. But it kind of breathes life into the woman who really had an impact. Right, yeah. right. You discover in the younger Harriet, too, that she doesn't want, she likes outdoors. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't want to, her mother tells her, you get to, um, you're going to get to work in, in the house, in the big house, you know, and you'll get to sit in a nice soft chair from time to time and all that kind of stuff. And she's like, I don't want to work in the big house. I'd rather be in the field. Right. You know, she liked the outdoors, which is, you know, you could see why then she was so cool. instrumental in the whole escape, you know, to freedom yeah. and, and conducting the under, Underground Railroad. Sharon, we kind of roll back with Sharon Cook, because you've been with Haras since you were forever. knee high or yes. whatever they call it. Yeah. But going back to the interview that I did with Tristan and, and Angela Williams in the first segment, where mm -hmm. we talked about them growing up in a family of people who took an interest in care, your, your parents also took an interest in what was going on in town, right? Right, right. Does that mean something to you in directing this play? That whole idea of that peek back? Oh, of course, of course it does. Um, the whole idea of, um, you know, what my family, what my parents, what my grandparents went through um, during a time of race, racial segregation mm -hmm. and the whole civil rights movement, um, has a profound impact on me because I don't want to take for granted um, the rights and the privileges that I that I enjoy, the freedoms that I enjoy that they at one point in time in their lives didn't. And um, um, so um, all of that comes into play even with helping to establish this particular production, you know. I get on my soapbox and I'll do my little mm -hmm. spiel, have my little sermonette, um, and we'll go into a whole little history kind of lesson yeah or sermon, as I like to say, about... <laughs> and then it changes everything right. as to how you see... Right, it gives the, the yeah. actors a whole different perspective in terms of their characters and the play and the appreciation for, for this woman and the work that she mm -hmm. did right. and the work that um, the Quakers did because they're the ones who actually kicked off the Underground Railroad. You know, there was a one Quaker in particular named Levi Collins, I believe his name was, very instrumental in, because they, they believe, the Quakers be, believed that slavery was a sin. It was mm -hmm. wrong. And it was, went totally against um, their moral and core values, their Christian beliefs. And so that's why they initiated all of this. And I discovered in my um, research that they did not keep records because this was federal law. Right. You know, and so in order to keep records if that were discovered, they would be incriminating themselves. So I thought that was just... Well, for those viewers who keep records, they got to go to their calendar because they've got to go. February 15th, 16th, and 17th, it's at the Perry Family Theater yes. in the Hurrah mm -hmm. Building. Close, right. intimate theater. You'll be yes. able to talk about it up close and personal. Probably don't want to tell you that. But yeah. the audience will be real close. And that'll give them, that'll impact the audience even more mm -hmm. as they discover they are, this woman, her life, and, and her journey. Yes. They are in for an awesome experience. Exactly, they sure are. Yep. We want to hear from you what you'd like to see on TV 48, but more importantly, what's going on in your community and what do you like to celebrate? Give us a holler at 664 6510. And as usual, it's a wonderful time to be in Norfolk just because of you and you and you.